Well, thank you very much for the invitation to come here. Uh, it's a great honour. I don't actually get very many invitations to talk in Milton Keynes, which is, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> but as, you know, chance would have it, I've got two invitations to talk in Milton Keynes, and one of them is at quarter past 11 this morning. Oh, really? Yeah, I know, I know, and I'm afraid I can't, it's, a, it's also, it's a, a personal invitation, so I can't actually, uh, I couldn't decline it, so I'm afraid I'm going to have to rush off uh, relatively quickly after I talk, which I'm really sorry about, because I, I usually like to stick around and, and, and chat to people. But thanks very much for the... Um, uh, introduction. I'm going to talk about Feli. Uh, I'm going to talk about the Rosetta mission and I'm going to decide where's the best place for me to stand so that I don't stand in front of uh, the pictures. So let's, can I drag this over here and I'll stand to the side. Right, okay, let's get going. Right, first of all, uh, thank you. First of all, um, the Rosetta mission went to a comet, Comet 67P, Churyumov Gerasimenko, and it cost several billion euros, uh, which is a lot of money, uh, just to satisfy the uh, project of going to a comet and landing on it. And you might think, well, why, why would we want to do that? What's the scientific reason for doing it? Part of the reason uh, is, or a big part of the reason, was to look at what the comet is made from. Now, comets date from the very earliest times of solar system history. Uh, the, the solar system was formed from a cloud of gas and dust, very dynamic, uh, at time 4,567, 4,567 uh, million years ago. So that's a, quite an easy number to remember. And at that time, this bit of molecular cloud collapsed and all the gas, which is mainly hydrogen, most of it went into the sun, and some of the dust formed the terrestrial planets, Mercury, Venus, Mar uh, Earth, and Mars, you know, so all the dusty stuff, and then the rest of the gas and the ice, which was further away from the sun, got swept up making the giant planets. And what, what um, separates the giant planets from the inner rocky planets is the asteroid belt. And at the edge, of the solar system, we've got something called the Kuiper Belt. So the asteroid belt is made of rocky and metal stuff, and the Kuiper Belt is made of dust and icy stuff. And comets were formed out there, beyond the snow line, where there was ice could condense. And at the time when the Earth was forming, it was incandescently hot and the surface, the whole of the surface of the earth was molten and that's what that picture at the top is meant to indicate, you know, it's sort of like a, a boiling earth. And when that happens, you get rid of most of the water, you get rid of a lot of the carbon dioxide, you get rid of a lot of these volatile um, uh, uh, compounds. But we know, you know, from today, you know, you only have to look out the window where it's drizzling a bit. We know there's plenty of water on the Earth. So where's that come from if most of it boiled away when the Earth was formed? Well, it's been added later. It's been added by bombardment from asteroids and from comets. So one of the things that we want to understand is how much, if any, of the water has been added by comets. What, what links the Earth? To, uh, to comets. And the other thing is comets also have a huge amount of carbon in them. And carbon, one of the building blocks of life, you know, the DNA molecule is, is, is made of carbon. Uh, all the, all, you know, we're made of carbon. And the idea of analyzing and looking at comets is to see how the carbon in the comets relates to life on Earth. Now, comets did not bring life to Earth. They didn't bring bacteria, they didn't bring bacterial spores or fungi or anything, or aliens, they didn't bring anything to Earth other than simple molecules, building blocks. And that's why we want to study them, to see how much and what type of those building blocks were present. So I've talked about asteroids and comets, and they are different objects, but they are related. And a distinguished colleague of mine many years ago uh, described how we now think of asteroids and comets. We used to think of them as if they were animals in a zoo. And you had asteroids in one cage, and you had comets in another cage. Now we think of it more like a safari park where the animals roam free. But you might want to sort of have 
the asteroids in this field and the comets in that field, where they can diffuse together. So they are, there isn't the clear-cut distinction that they used to be. However, asteroids have circular orbits in the plane of the ecliptic. So if you think of, if you think of the, the solar system as a, as a flat disk, then all the uh, planets orbit on that level. And they orbit the sun. And the asteroids orbit the sun on that level. Comets have much more elliptical orbits, and they can be very steeply uh, angled to that plane. So they can come in from up there and come down, or here, or here, or here. So their, their orbits are much more difficult to predict. So we have these differences between asteroids and comets. So, so they, uh, they're both orbiting the sun, but one lot are on circular orbits. In the plane of the ecliptic, others are, uh, the comets are uh, steeply inclined on elliptical orbits. Some are very close to the plane of the ecliptic, and that's, that's the type that uh, the Rosetta mission visited. If it, was one of the, if it had tried to go to a comet that was you know, coming down towards the plane of the ecliptic like that, it couldn't have done it. It would have taken far too much energy to get away from the plane of the ecliptic. So that's why this particular comet was chosen. Now, it's not the first mission that the European Space Agency had sent to a comet. The first mission was in 1985-86. Um, and this was a, a, a mission that I remember very well. Uh, because we had been trying, even before this mission to Halley's Comet, the Giotto mission taking place, we'd started to put together a, a proposal to send another instrument to a different comet to do more work, because we knew that we wouldn't get as much information as we wanted to from this particular, from this particular mission. So the Giotto mission... Um, it only took uh, a year to get, well, less than a year to get there, and it just flew past the nucleus of Halley's Comet. And this was the first close-up image we'd got of a comet, and you can see it's, you know, this sort of, it's dark, sun's coming from this side, and there are flares coming off, these are jets coming off. Now, at this time, the description of a comet went from being a dirty snowball to an icy dirt ball. And you might think, well, what's the difference? Well, if you think of making a snowball, all right, you take lots of snow, and you might, if you're really wicked, put a stone in the middle <laughs> to lob at somebody. But when you make that, pick up the snow, you get a bit of soil in it and stuff like that. But it's dominantly ice, and you compact it, uh, dominantly slow, you compact it together, you make ice. So that's, that's a dirty snowball. But an icy dirt ball, is where you take a whole load of mud, mink it together, soak it in water, freeze it. You've got more mud than you have ice. And the measurements that showed that this was what comets were like, the, the internal bit, the nucleus of the comet, came from a Russian probe uh, as well as the, um, the Giotto uh, uh, European probe because they looked at the surface and they looked to see how light the surface was, how much light shone, reflected light shone from the surface, and they found it was very dark, had hardly any light, and when they looked at the um, composition of the surface, they found that there was a huge amount of carbon, more carbon coming off than they thought, and the, the surface of a comet is dark, and that was... Uh, that that was, has been shown over and over again with other um, instruments that have looked at comets and it was also confirmed when we looked at this particular comet. So the Rosetta mission went to this comet, 67P, Chorium of Grasimenko. Now, as uh, people doing outreach, you would think, well, I really, really, really don't want to go to a comet called Churyum of Gerasimenko. You know, it takes a lot, it takes a lot to memorise this. I'd rather go to a comet called, you know, Smith Jones or something, something like that. Unfortunately, you don't get to choose. You have to look at the dynamics of the object as it's coming around the solar system. And the real problem was it, when Rosetta was first planned, it wasn't going to go to this comet. It was going to go to another comet called Comet Vertinen. But unfortunately, there was a problem with the Ariane launcher. Not, not, when, not the launch that had 
uh, Rosetta on board, but a, a, a previous launch, which meant that the launch program was suspended for a year, which meant that Comet Vertinen wouldn't be in the right place at the right time for when Rosetta was going to get there. So there was a lot of work done um, by uh, um, uh, a lot of work done by the, the software people and the modelers to try and find a comet which would have the right trajectory, which would be in the right place at the right time. And it happened to be this tiny little one, which is four kilometers across, called Chorium of Gerasimenko. So the mission was launched in March 2004, and it took the scenic route to get to Mars. Uh, sorry, to get to the comet, as you can see. It was launched in March 2004, and it went round the Earth, and it went round Mars, and it went round the Earth, and it went round the Earth. So it did, it kept, it was doing these swing bys, these gravitational swing bys, to pick up sufficient energy from those planets to give it enough momentum so that it could go out into the outer part of the solar system. Uh, and on the way there, not, it's not marked, is it? Or is it maybe? Um, uh, on the way there, it passed two asteroids, uh, asteroid Steins and asteroid Lutetia. And when it went past asteroid Lutetia, all the instruments were switched on so that, that uh, it could be seen to see if they were working. And they were working, and they worked fine. And then what happened in June 2011 was everything was switched off. And I like to think of this as just this spacecraft cruising out beyond the Earth. It's got enormous solar panels. Its power supply was solar energy. You know, going out, it's dark, it's silent. It's all switched off except for a little red light beeping on the dashboard, which is waiting for communications. All right, now you know what it's like waiting for communications. So in January 2014, Rosetta exits hibernation. So a signal was sent to Rosetta saying, wake up. Rosetta, and Rosetta woke up. Now, that doesn't sound terribly dramatic. Yes, it does. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it does. <laughs> All right. It's, it's, it it's really, it was really dramatic because not only had this thing been in hibernation for, you know, the best part of three years, but what you've got to remember is that it had been launched 10 years previously. And, it, you know, the build phase had been going on for several years prior to that. So it was, you know, it's not exactly valve technology, but, you know, getting close. And so, you know, if you think, if you put some of your equipment that you built 10 years ago using technology that was 20 years old, if you put it in a deep freeze for two and a half years and then you took it out of the deep freeze, and then switched it on and expected it to work s straight off. You'd be a bit surprised if it did, you know. So it wasn't just it wasn't just that everybody was, you know, hoping for the best. They were, you know, down on their knees praying to whatever <laughs> god or you know that th th that would actually smile on them. So, and it's great talking to a room of engineers who really appreciate this, you know, because. Uh, I, I often talk to school students and they're sort of, well, yeah, well, yeah, 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 um, <laughs> 10 year old technology, what's that? We just throw it away and buy a new one. So, so it did, it, it, it actually, I understand they had to, you know, like switch it on and off again a few times and maybe shake it, but it, it, did, it did reply. The communications worked, which was good. And then um, what happened was the uh, Rosetta spacecraft flew alongside the comet while it was getting closer to the sun. Now, as the comet comes closer to the sun, the surface warms up and gas uh, and dust come off and make this massive, huge, huge long tail, which are hundreds of thousands of kilometers long. Uh, now, if you're a spacecraft and you're following something which is giving off a load of dust, that's not good because the way the spacecraft orientates itself is to look at stars. It has a star tracker. And if you've got lots of dust there, which are pretending to be stars, then it upsets the star tracker and it goes into safe mode. And this happened several times. But the idea was that the um, spacecraft would fly alongside Rosetta. And it, it didn't go into orbit around, uh, sorry, it didn't go into orbit around the comet. Rosetta didn't go into orbit around 67P. It, it, it described pathways around it, all right? Going into orbit means something is gravitationally bound, and the spacecraft was not gravitationally bound to the comet. So it had to make all these, all, all, all these trajectory um, 
uh, corrections all the time so that it could fly with the comet nucleus and map the comet nucleus so we've got a really good idea of what the comet looked like so that, um, uh, so that it could land safely. Okay, so in um, beginning of July 2014, this image of the comet was produced and it was not as had been anticipated. You know, what had been anticipated was a potato or a peanut, you know, because they're, they're how comets are usually described. And what they got was this. And lots of um, <laughs> suggestions. And I, I'm told the engineers, when they saw this, they sort of went, oh, duck, or, 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 or something very close to that. I'm not sure. And the reason they were really concerned was feel I had to land on this comet. And to know, to enable it to land, they had to know the mass of the comet. They knew the mass of Philae. They had to know the mass of the comet so they could calculate the momentum and all these things. And the way they were going to uh, determine the mass of the comet was that they could assume a density because comets had low densities and they pretty much knew what that was. So if they knew the density, they had to get a shape model to produce the volume so they could then infer the mass and so they could calculate all things. So. Engineers being engineers, they said, it's not a sphere. We can't land on it. Your mission that you have been planning for all these years, <laughs> we're not going to do it. It's too difficult. Because these two, these two lobes don't know, are they the same? Are they, are they the same material that has been one body which has had bits broken off it in collisions? Or is it two separate bodies that have come and stuck together um, you know, we don't know. We cannot tell you what this is. Our shape models that we've been calculating and refining for the last five years. No, you know, it won't work. You can't do it. All right. So there was a not a uh, there was a free and frank exchange of ideas and then some debate and then the engineers um, said, well, all right, you know, just this once. But it's not got to change its shape, and whatever happens, it's not got to get more craggy and dangerous looking. So, by the time we got to only a month later, the comet had got more craggy and dangerous looking. And the engineers threw another wobbly and said, no, no, we can't. Oh, all right, then, yeah, we'll do it. So, the synergy between scientists and engineers is one of the most essential parts of any space mission because scientists have ideas engineers have the know-how and um, I'm sure I'm not uh, offending you too much if I say engineers tend to be a bit more risk averse than scientists I mean if you're an engineer and you've got to design a bridge that's going to go and <laughs> carry cars across a river you've got to be fairly certain that it's not going to fall in the river the first time a car goes across it. So you've got to make sure that it's working. And, and so engineers, the, the engineers that I've worked with, you go to them with a problem and they say no. And then they come back 10 minutes later and say, well, actually, uh, yes, we can do it if you do it this way, this way, this way. And then they come up with a wonderful solution, which is much better than anything that you would have envisaged. And, and this is how it has to work. And it works when it works well, it works really, really well. And uh, I've got many good friends who are engineers. So, so that's why I can be rude about engineers, all right? So this was seen, this picture was seen, and I don't know, you probably can't see because it's quite light in here, but there is actually a faint jet of dust coming out here. Now, the picture at the top, at the top there, that is also uh, an image of uh, 67P. That was taken by a telescope in Chile uh, at the same time as this was taken by the cameras on the Rosetta spacecraft. And you can see that top image up there, it looks like a, a regular comet, it's got the nucleus, you can see the tail. But when you're up close, you just don't see that tail at all. 
So it's decided, right, OK, where are we going to land? We're going to look at different landing spots on the, on the comet and hone in as to when, when that uh, landing was going to take place. And this is the first image that was taken of the comet and the landing site by the Philae lander. So Rosetta was the mother craft. It had got, oh, I don't know, a dozen or so instruments on board measuring all sorts of things but of course the the most important instruments were the navigational camera and the uh, narrow angle camera which uh, took fantastic images of the comet and then Philae was this little lander that was going to um, land on this comet and what it was going to do was it was let go by the uh, Rosetta mother craft at uh, 10 o'clock uh, on the morning of November the 12th 2014 and it was given a push a bit of a boost a push towards I mean you know push towards it's just like well you know it's like are we going oh, was it up or down or this way or that way you know it's like it's all in space but it went it was it was given a trajectory towards where they wanted it to land on the comet and then it was taking it took seven hours to actually land on the comet. And the way I describe that is in comparison with NASA's um, delivery of the Curiosity rover to Mars the previous year, uh, as Curiosity came through the Martian atmosphere, that took seven, uh, there were seven minutes when there was no communication because it was coming through the atmosphere. And NASA described this as seven minutes of terror and they made this amazing film about seven minutes of terror. Well, sitting in Darmstadt at the ESA Operations Centre, we didn't have seven minutes of terror. We had seven hours of tedium, fueled only by the most disgusting coffee it's ever <laughs> been my, my uh, sorrow to drink. I mean, it was just, it was just awful. So we, we watched this, this build-up to the comet land, to the uh, feli landing, and we got the pictures, we knew where it was supposed to land, it was supposed to land in some, you know, beautiful, sun, sunny, but not too hot, because the electronics would, fl would fry, uh, it was going to land somewhere where its batteries could charge up, could charge up. So feli had on board a permanent battery, which had 70 hours worth of power in it, and it also had solar panels, covered in solar panels, so that the secondary batteries could be charged up by solar power. Um, but unfortunately, Philae didn't land correctly. Instead of landing like this, in a beautiful sunlit plain, it landed like that, down a dark crevasse, because various things went wrong. And it was one of those um, things, let's see, what's my next slide? Yes, okay, let's, let's go back and keep looking at that picture. It's one of those things that you just don't know how you're going to react because we knew this was, this, this was a, a bit worrisome. At the beginning of the day, it was known that one of the three landing mechanisms wasn't working. So Philae had on board, it had a, a, a rocket, a thruster at the top which was going to help when it got closer to the comet, it was going to kick in and gradually help again, you know, push it, if you like, towards the surface. But it was known that that wasn't going to fire. It was known at the beginning of the day. But there were still two other mechanisms. There were harpoon, which was going to fire into the surface of the comet, and it was going to sort of anchor the comet or, or sort of um, stabilize it. And then each of the three legs of Philae had sort of like crampons on the, on the end and they were going to stick in to the surface. They were going to grip onto the surface. And so everything seemed to have, have gone marvelously. I mean, there, there was this big room in, in uh, uh, Darmstadt where there are all the dignitaries, you know, the mayor of Darmstadt, the science minister for Germany, the science minister for the UK, all the science ministers of all the ESA countries, the head of the UK Space Agency, all sorts of important people were there. And then loads and loads of journalists, just the world's press were just there. And then 11, 10 worried, no, yeah, 11 worried men 
all right, sitting in a little, in, in little cocoon by themselves. These 11 worried men, and they were all men, were the principal investigators of the 11 instruments on the Philae Lander. Now, among those 11 men uh, was Professor Ian Wright, who is a professor of planetary sciences at the Open University, and he's the principal investigator of the Ptolemy instrument, and it was he who designed and led the team who built the Ptolemy instrument. And I should also say, just for public records, that he's my husband, all right? <laughs> Uh, and we've been together for uh, 36 years now, and it is not true to say that I slept my way into this position. I didn't. You could say maybe that Ian did. So, so the principal investigators of the instruments were there in this room, which is a bit bizarre, given that their teams were in another room in Cologne, sort of 200 kilometres away, which is how ESA does these things goodness knows why. But just before the landing, so it's about four o'clock, this thing was scheduled to land at quarter to five. Just before four o'clock, the principal investigators were, went away into another room so that they could talk directly to and listen to their teams and monitor actually directly what was going on, which all the dignitaries and the random people who were there uh, couldn't do. So we'd got this, we knew this, this picture came in at about four o'clock. And so we knew that it was, it was nearly there, it was just, it was about to, it was about to happen. Now, journalists are not very good in understanding that if engineers say it's going to happen at quarter to five, it's going to happen at quarter to five. It's not going to happen at ten past four or twenty past four. Or, or, or whatever, it's going to happen at quarter to five. And if engineers say it happens at quarter to five, but because it takes uh, almost 20 minutes for the signal, because of the speed of light, uh, we will get the signal back. We will know at two minutes past five whether this has landed or not. And journalists don't understand that. You know, so at quarter to five, it's like, well, why haven't we heard anything? And the journalists were going crazy. And they would talk to anybody who would stand still long enough <laughs> uh, to talk. And they were asking the same thing all the time. You know, they'd be saying things like, why hasn't it happened yet? Are you worried? Do you think something should have happened yet? Why haven't we heard yet? Are you excited? Are you worried? Are you worried? Are you excited? And it's just going on and on and on like this. And we'd had seven hours <laughs> of, of, of caffeine, all right, and this. And so it's not surprising when it landed that people got quite excited, yeah, including me. You know, it's landed. You know, I was just like, you know, happened to be next to... David Shookman, the BBC correspondent, and I gave David a big hug, and now he winces and backs away whenever he sees me you know, in the room. You know, so it's, um, it's like, mind you, last time I saw David, he was on the television the other day doing something about a fatberg in London, and it's like, oh, well, there are things worse than me, David. <laughs> Definitely. So, so we'd got the signal. The signal came down, and it was announced, yes, it's landed, it's fantastic. And, you know, champagne was handed out and Ian came back into the room and he came and he gave me a big hug and I was like, oh, you know, were you excited? You know, were you worried? I was saying all the same things to him. And he just put his face close to mine and he whispered in my ear. He said, keep smiling, it's all gone belly up. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, well, uh, what? <laughs> and he said, it's landed but it's bounced. All right, so... And what they'd seen was um, the accelerometer and the magnetometers had seen this is the signal, it's bounced, all right? So they got that. I, or they, it's touched down. Oh, bugger, it's bounced, all right? You know, it should, have, it should have touched down. And you can see that this happened at 1535. Now, what you've got to remember is this is UT. And I was talking about... Uh, Central European time or whatever it, whatever it is so this is actually 1635 all right in the time I was talking about so it landed a bit earlier than it should have done because the thruster wasn't slowing it down the harpoons didn't slow it down it bounced it touched down a second time all right two hours later so there was two hours of concern now it, it, it took about an hour for ESA to say, to admit that it hadn't landed safely, 
all right. But then it bounced a third time, but which was so it, it sort of hit, it bounced, hit, bounced. All right, so How it close bounced. Was it to going bouncing and staying off. They're not they're not certain, but it was it was pretty close. You know, if it had if it had been any worse, it, we'd have lost it entirely. And so this is what it did. Uh, I can't reach that from here. <coughs> All right, so it hit, it landed here instead of here because it was going too fast. It went up, it bounced, it came back down here and it bounced a second time and it landed somewhere down here in the dark in a crevasse. Now, the way that people have put a spin on it is that, well, actually, what we'd wanted to do initially was visit different sites on the surface of the comet, <laughs> but we knew it would be too expensive. <laughs> so this is the way we did it, this way, all right? So um, most of the instruments worked and got good data. Te no, all 11 of the instruments worked. Unfortunately, one of the instruments got no data, and that was the drill. Because the idea was this thing landed, it had got a drill, which was going to drill down into the comet. Now, they know that the drill operated, they could tell, you know, they sent it to, but because it was on its side, it wasn't drilling into what it should have been drilling into. So I'd say thin air, but you know, there wasn't even any thin air there. So, so unfortunately the drill worked, but it didn't contact, which meant that the two of the other uh, instruments, in instrument Ptolemy and another instrument called Kozak, they couldn't do their full range of um, experiments because they needed the drill to deliver material into their ovens. But what they had was they were able to analyze the material that was around them and some, some that had fallen into the ovens. And I'll explain about that um, in a minute. So everything, you know, it's like, OK, it's not quite where we think it is, but it's still communicating with us. You know, that's, that's fine. It is communicating using its main battery. And so we've got 70 hours to actually do stuff. All right. Now, this is the handwritten flow diagram that Ian Wright says up there, Rosetta CCS. That's a uh, cometary carbon sampler. All right. Um, Mark 1, IPW, that's Ian Peter Wright, 24th of March 1994. All right. So that is his flow diagram for Ptolemy. Now, by 1994, the Rosetta mission had been accepted by ESA. It had been funded. It was being built. It was it was happening. But in the years running up to this, you have to sort of propose a mission. You have to get it funded. You know, you have to go through all the political stuff. The first cometary mission that I was involved with was a proposal called Cipher. C-I-F-E-R, Cometary Isotope Front End Reactor, was what it was called. And um, it was, uh, the principal investigator was Colin Pillinger, uh, from Beagle 2 fame, okay. Colin was my PhD supervisor, and he was Ian's PhD supervisor. He, uh, uh, we, we, Ian and I met as students. And Colin wrote this proposal, and I had a very important part to play in this proposal. At the time he wrote it, it must have been 1980, uh, 79 to 80, 79, 80. And um, we were over at Cambridge, because that's where, that, that's where uh, Colin was based. And the proposal had to be typed, and this is when it's good to be talking to people of a slightly uh, more ancient age, let's say. Um, it was typed on a stencil and then had to go through a Ronio. Yeah. Now, the typing only did, you know, letters and numbers. It didn't do symbols. And there was a micron in this. And so everywhere there was a micron, there was a U. And I had to go through this proposal with a pencil and a ruler and put the tail on the micron. <laughs> <laughs> and that was, my, that was my first 
um, uh, uh, my, my first meeting with what it was to write a proposal. But anyway, you know, it's still done, still done by hand. But by the time, and that proposal wasn't accepted, it eventually transformed itself into Rosetta. This then, of course, is what the CAD people did when they took Ian's hand-drawn diagram and they produced uh, uh, this. And in a similar fashion, this is the prototype, uh, which is called Finesse. It's in the labs just across the road. It's used every day. It's custom designed. We prefer that to homemade. All right, it's yeah. custom designed. Um, and it's massive. As you can see, Sasha's standing up, he's six foot tall, and it's you know bigger than him. By the time you've taken it and shrunk it down to something like that, so it can go on a comet, it looks a bit smaller. So we took something gigantic, and I keep saying we, I didn't do any of it, you know, it's Ian's team. Took something gigantic, made it smaller. Uh, that's Andy Morse, who's the deputy principal investigator, and uh, he's also at uh, the OU. And what we've got here is two helium tanks, uh, a lot of wiring, special wireman comes in, somebody who specializes in soldering tiny, tiny bits of wire to tiny, tiny bits of components. Uh, and he's space qualified. He's a, you have to have space qualified engineers to do all this. Um, now, what, we, what you've got here, um, let's go back to the previous slide. Oops, no, sorry, wrong one. What you've got here is, you've got down here is a furnace, all right? You can't see it. But the sample goes in the furnace and it gets heated up. And what happens is gas, it, it's heated up with oxygen, so it's combusted. Um, and what happens is any carbon in the sample turns to carbon dioxide, any hydrogen in the sample gets turned to water. And then the rest of all this gubbins, all right, is to separate the water from the carbon dioxide and anything else, noble gases and stuff like that, so that pure carbon dioxide goes into one system and pure nitrogen, actually, is the other thing that we're interested, goes into another system. And that's what all that other stuff is to do. And what we're interested in doing is it's mass spectrometry, all right? And so this is a mass spectrometer. And the uh, Ptolemy instrument is a combined gas chromatograph mass spectrometer. And it does, uh, so there's two methods of operating, all right? So you can take, um, a mixture of uh, gases, you can just suck them straight into the uh, system, which is where this is, all right, sample inlet, and this is the system over here, all right. So you can suck in a mixture of gases, have them go through a, a, a long, long, thin capillary column, and then they get separated out in terms of, oh, this one weighs 18, it's possibly water, this one weighs 44, it might be carbon dioxide, this one weighs 64, it might be sulfur dioxide. So you spread them out by mass. Or you can take the sample in and you could send it into some ovens here, burn it, turn all your, everything into carbon dioxide, which has a mass of 44, and then put it through a mass, different type of mass spectrometer, which separates things from, it, it will separate the carbon 12 from the carbon 13, those two stable isotopes. Now, the team could not do those experiments because that required a solid sample, which they were going to um, get from the drill. So they could only do the gas inlet. So they called this the sniffing mode. So it's like, Ah, what's here? Mmm, curry, baby's nappies, that sort of thing, all right? So, uh, ah, all right, and this is, this, this is the business end. This is actually the, um, uh, the detector. It's an iron trap detector. It has an electron source, which you uh, pass a current through. Those electrons uh, ionize the gas that goes in there because what you're actually analyzing is positive ions, uh, and you hold the voltage stable on your iron trap and because it's an iron trap it's measuring everything it's like one count equals one iron all right it doesn't it's not got electron multipliers and all that sort of stuff it's 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 one count equals one iron so it's detecting one iron at a time uh, oh and there it is it was the first instrument to be delivered all right so it was at the the bottom and Ian always says, if you're going to be involved in a space mission, do not be delivering the first instrument that has to be integrated. 
because then everybody else can let their schedules slip and blame you. But we can't do it until the OU team have you know, nailed their instrument to the, uh, the base plate. All right, so these are some of the, um, the data that um, the team got. And uh, uh, peaks for water and CO2 have been removed. All right, so that was a peak at 18 and a peak at 44. These are the molecular masses. And they've been removed because they just went through the roof. There was just so many of those ions. These blue ones, as it says there, come from cracking of polyoxymethylene. Now, polyoxymethylene is uh, an ion that had possibly been identified by Giotto in Halley's Comet. And it's a long chain molecule, which is just carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. And depending on where you break it, uh, it can be a building block for sugar. All right, so the fact that they think they saw polyoxymethylene implies that they've got building blocks for sugars, and sugars are important for um, uh, life. They found small quantities of nitrogen com containing uh, components. If you can see up there, that says that's um, hydroxylated ammonia, all right, and up here you've got something which is uh, cyanomethane. And these things, again, are building blocks which will react together to form glycine. And so although Ian's team didn't detect glycine on the comet, it was in the nucleus, it was detected in the coma. Right, so I better uh, hurtle on. Um, right, so the, there was an instrument called um, Rosina, which was on the... On the um, Rosetta spacecraft, and it was analysing the gases that were coming off in the, in the jets. And it found a whole load of different things, methane, ethane, and they've, they've put them into this zoo of all different, all different molecules. They found really nasty things, hydrogen cyanide. They did find glycine, the amino acid, uh, cyanogen, acetic acid, all sorts of stuff, noble gases, hydrogen fluoride, all everything you can imagine they found there uh, and uh, a huge amount of water and the composition of the water is not identical to the composition of the water on the earth but if you mixed hydrogen from the sun with some of this hydrogen from the comet you can come eventually to something that is like the water on earth now i have to accelerate um, so that's what Ptolemy did. Um, there's a whole load. One of the great things about the, the mission was that Rosetta, although Ptolemy ran out of juice after about 70 hours, and it was Ian's mass spec that drained the battery, uh, for the, he did the final experiment, um, the Rosetta spacecraft carried on going. Uh, it went through perihelion, so it went round the sun with the comet and then came back out again, following the comet all the way. Now, obviously, when the, when the comet was closest to the sun, the spacecraft had to go further away because so much dust and gas was, was coming off it. But because it had been following the comet for the best part of two years, lots of changes in the landscape could be seen where gas and dust had come away, where dust had fallen back. And there's now a whole new science which is looking at these landscape changes on the comet surface. When we look at landscape changes on the Earth, we think of them in terms of, oh, glaciers, U-shaped valleys, you know, we all did this at school, rivers, V-shaped valleys, meanders, all these sorts of things, where you can't interpret stuff on a comet like this. For a start, you haven't got any gravity. Well, only, you know, not very much gravity. And the, the thing's tumbling and twisting. It has a 12-hour rotation. So you have to think of things in, in different ways. So the changing cometary landscape is, uh, uh, well, it's occupying people's minds, let's say. And then Philae was found, uh, beginning of September uh, 2016, it was found. Here it is. Poor little feli. You can see its legs, and it's so it's it, it's on its on its side, and it did come to life again. It was hoped that it would come to life when the comet got closer to the sun, and so that um, the dark where it was would be illuminated, and so its solar 
panels would charge its batteries and that happened and it did communicate but very sporadically for a very very short period of time and they, they reckon the antenna was broken you know and that's so so it's like it's sitting there your batteries charged everything would work apart from the antenna well there's communications for you so <laughs> So on the 30th of September 2016, uh, Rosetta took its death glide onto the surface, all right? It, was, it had run out of hydrazine, which was the fuel that was allowing it to make all these, um, all these um, rotations around the, the, the trajectories around the comet. And so it could have just sort of just carried on drifting, but the team decided, the Rosetta team decided they would glide it onto the surface to get the most possible um, data they could get back. And so these, this is a series of images which is as Rosetta got closer and closer to the surface. And you can see they are amazing, really, in, in the detail of what they found. And that, they thought, was the final image taken from a distance of about four metres. And you think, God, couldn't they even get it in focus? They've had all this time. <laughs> <coughs> but a couple of weeks ago, they found they reconstituted some telemetry data that they found, you know, in the back of the settee and got the final image. So that is the final image um, from from the comet and you can see it's about a meter across so fantastic resolution just just amazing when you when you look at that so that is the that's the final image now this may or may not work uh, let's go back uh. finally Rosetta's big day had come it was time for her to join Philae on Comet 67P Churyumov Gerasimenko. So ends the amazing adventure of our two extraordinary explorers, Rosetta and Philae, at Comet 67P. Farewell, dear friends. All right, now if you do any outreach with, um, with people, just look at the ESA website and just put in Rosetta cartoons because there's a whole series of them and they are absolutely fantastic. They're really, really good. So this is one of my favourite images of the, um, the mission, where you can see the jets coming out. They don't come out from the whole of the comet. They just come out from different places on the surface of the comet, um, which you know we thought they came out equally. They don't. Uh, and it is, it's been a, a real... It's been a, a, a real voyage and it's been a privilege to be part of it. And of course, as a university academic, one uses what one has learnt. And so that image is at the header of our new masters in space sciences, which re uses Rosetta as one of its case studies. So if you've enjoyed this talk and you want to know more, then please go to the Open University website and find out. Have I got any Open University students in the audience? I usually try and ask. Yay, good. Uh, well, you know, current or past, just come and say hi at the end because it's always good to talk to our students. And so, but we do integrate what we've learned. We're writing, I'm writing a new uh, level one, you know, so entry level on planetary sciences, which is using Rosetta as well. So it's, it's like we do these things for the research, for what we can learn about, but we also put it into our teaching, which is just as important as well. And thank you very much again for the opportunity to come and talk to you.
Uh, and if you don't want, is it coffee break now? If you don't run away to, for coffee too quickly, then... Two, uh, two couple of questions? Yeah, yeah, Have you sure. got time for? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, a um, couple of questions for Monica. Uh, just here, because I can read. Good morning. Thank you very much. Very interesting. I'd just like to know, you know, basically using chromatography for analysis there, did you limit your detection range or did you, yeah. you did yeah, limit yeah. that? The, the detection was up to about 120 Daltons. Um, and that was because of the size of what we could do. You know, if we'd had a bigger system, then you could have made the resolution better. But we could only go up to... We, we had unit resolution, whereas a, te as a regular a GC system would have a resolution of 1,000, which is what Rosina had. So it, was, it went up to about 120. Thank you. Yes. We see the jets coming off in all directions. What causes those? Right, well, interesting. Um, that's, the, that's now the subject of a lot of uh, investigation. Uh, you know, you, you, you'd think, it's like, right, okay, you know, the, face, face that's, the side that's facing the sun, the sun's on it, it's bound to be, that's where most of the jets are going to come, come from. But that's not always the case. I mean, the thing is tumbling, and, and it has a rotation of... Tw of um, uh, pe pe period of 12 hours so the the surface is getting heated reasonably fast and because it's black it absorbs that heat and what happens is the um, when it goes into the night time the the face that was heated up um, obviously right on the surface the heat dissipates but some of the heat just below the surface a millimeter or so two millimeters below the surface is still there and lasts for slightly longer and um, you can get uh, maybe you know it's just if there's a fragment of ice there that suddenly melts you can get a burst so it's not completely understood but they they know most of the jets come out on the sun facing side but they think it's the residual heat which causes jets to come out and then it's one of those things that uh, if you have a jet that's come out of this bit and it's made a bit of a hole then you've got a more active surface and you might have more ice further down which then gets heat on it and and comes out so it's one of those sort of self-propagating things and they've found pits which they think have been caused by previous jets so it's it's a big subject of study at the moment fascinating stuff uh, and inspiring um as you, as you said, we're mainly engineers, but to see what, what, what our fellow engineers have, have created for the, sci the science. Uh, well, and, I, I, and, I'd and take this into school, because, and then I'd say uh, to a class, how many of you would like to be scientists? How many would like to be engineers? You know, and, and, and there aren't enough, quite frankly. There still aren't enough. And I look at you... And you <laughs> said you said you know you were mainly older gentlemen, uh, but I can see a, a a sprinkling of ladies here. But I hope I don't offend too many of you. Uh, I can't see anybody here who isn't white. All right. That's true. Where's the diversity? All right. So it's not just that we need to get more women into engineering and science. It's actually broadening that spectrum and making sure that all communities are part of this exciting science and engineering projects that we can do. And it's a, it's a really, really difficult, difficult thing to do because by the time a kid's about 11, they've decided they don't want to, don't want to do science. Hard. Physics. Ooh, hard. We're working on that. Yeah. Um, there used to be some um, cardboard, <coughs> cardboard models. Oh, yeah, yeah, you can still get them via the ESA website. Yeah, I was just going to say, particularly on the fillet, I saw them when I was up at Estet a few years ago, and I just wondered if they were still avi mm. available for the outreach types. So. Yes, there's a whole outreach section of the uh, ESA website, ESA Rosetta website. Um, you can buy, I don't know whether they've run out, but great big plush rosettas you know about this big made of soft you know if you want to a toy for a kid but there are also the cardboard rosettas that you can you can build the spacecraft yeah well, I did spend some time on the yeah. project, oh did you oh right what were you doing the time of the 
Ah, uh, right, OK. <laughs> well, yeah. Monica, ladies and gentlemen, I mean, the one thing we can't control is time. Um, and it's moving on, and I've got this clock right in front of me. You, I know, have got, got to shoot off uh, to, an, to, a, to another person. I'll tell you what I'm doing. My, the next thing I'm doing is uh, um, I'm going to church, all right, because uh, our administrator... Uh, who's 85 is retiring and I'm doing the, uh, yeah, not eulogy, no. it's a funeral, isn't it? But <laughs> appreciate, I'm doing, I'm, I'm, I'm doing, I'm doing a 10 minute appreciation for her and I just could not get out of that. Good. So. Uh, and we've got a coffee break um, and then some more presentations, but can we please just show our appreciation again? <laughs> Thank you.